uh, from uh, Siberia and moved to uh, the Middle East, to Iran, Iraq, uh, where the women and, and uh, women stayed. The men joined the, the Allied forces, fought on the, on the Western Front uh, uh, in, uh, in Italy, Belgium, etc. They couldn't go back to Poland after the war because Stalin treated uh, anybody who fought on the Western flank but came from Siberia as a traitor. So if they went back to Poland after the war, they would have been executed. Hence, my parents couldn't go back and they, they went to the UK. So, so I uh, was born in the UK, studied in the UK, worked in the city of London. Um, at the same time, in the 1980s, this was the century. This is a, uh, this is the consequence of a century planned economy in Poland. Um, hands up if anybody can guess what type of shop this is, because it's very difficult to guess. It's, a, it's actually a butcher's shop, so uh, there's not much planning required there. Um, solidarity. Po po Poles know very much uh, what solidarity means. We, it's, it's, it's in our blood. We know in hard times, if we work together, we can uh, achieve tremendous uh, effects. And one of them was, of course, uh, 1980 was the beginning of solidarity. Uh, through the 80s, we infected other uh, countries of Central Europe, uh, culminating in the iconic collapse of, of the uh, Berlin Wall in uh, late 1989. Now, a couple of uh, other facts going back in history. Uh, Liberum Veto was uh, in the, in the uh, 17th century in Poland, so where one, uh, one member of parliament could actually uh, stop uh, any legal act going through, which made Poland a very weak country because um, taxes in those days were uh, applied on the poor. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, consequences of Liberum Veto was that the rich didn't want to tax themselves, which meant that uh, not much money was available for the military and of course, that caused our, our uh, neighbours, uh, Prussia, Russia, and um, excuse me, the Austrian Hungarian Empire, to partition Poland. So, Poland was partitioned in 1772 and was uh, off the political map from uh, then until uh, 1918. So, Poland missed out on the uh, uh, in the early 1800s in the uh, Industrial Revolution. It also Missed out uh, in the late 1800s, 1800s in the Electricity Revolution. And uh, in the 1950s, uh, Poland also missed out on the Computer Revolution. At that stage, we, we weren't partitioned anymore. We were, uh, we were under the communist rule again after the uh, se uh, Second World War. And in fact, 10 years before IBM had its desktop computer, Poland had uh, a smaller desktop computer uh, available. But unfortunately, our, our Soviet masters did not allow us to use our intellect to develop uh, this. We were more in the heavy manufacturing uh, uh, side. Poland intends uh, to be a, a forerunner in a global uh, revolution of, of uh, the digital revolution. And we've, we've already used a lot of uh, this uh, the, the data, digital data, to uh, combat uh, tax fraud, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. As I said, so uh, in 1989, the, the, the Berlin Wall fell down, and uh, Poland was one of the first countries to move from a century planned economy to, to, a, uh, to, to a free market economy. Um, Polish Lithuania, so just, uh, just probably back to the Polish Lithuania, it's the, in six, six, hello, uh, 1659 was the, 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 two, uh, the Republic of the, the uh, the Commonwealth of Two Republics, basically it was a precursor of the Economic Union uh, of the EU, which uh, Poland joined in, uh, to, sorry, 2000, go back. Poland joined in 2004. So originally we were already in, a, in, a, in a, the precursor of the EU in, in 1569. So, so uh, uh, we, we know the strength of solidarity working together. Um, so, since 1989, so now 30 years, Poland has a tremendous record on its uh, GDP growth. 30 years is, uh, I think, unique in the globe. Perhaps I think Australia has a, a similar record of 30 years uh, uh, um, uh, 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 economic growth, not even one quarter of recession. Um, this, is, this is now Warsaw, so it's a, it's a far cry from what uh, we, we saw over Warsaw 30 years ago. Where am I pointing to? That's it. Seems to be jumping too quickly. Okay. So, now on to uh, 
that gives you a bit of background. So Poland is, uh, claims the uh, claims the fame for a number of things. Uh, paperclip was a is a Polish invention. Uh, windscreen wipers in your car is a Polish invention. Uh, hurricane lamps are a Polish invention. Fortunately, we don't claim to have the claim to fame for taxes. Taxes were uh, implemented uh, 4,000 odd years ago in Mesopotamia, but uh, in those days, taxes were 20% uh, of the seed or, 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 ca or cattle as opposed to in cash. It was the United Kingdom which actually uh, implemented uh, taxes as we know it in the 18, in 1800 to uh, income tax was brought into finance. Stop jumping, come back. Okay, so where we have taxes, we have obviously, uh, well unfortunately, tax avoidance, uh, tax crime, etc. And uh, economists uh, uh, um, estimate that uh, globally we lose about five to six hundred billion dollars each, each year because of aggressive tax planning, tax havens, and, and, and tax fraud. Um, the Polish Institute, Economic Institute, estimates that in Europe alone we lose every year 170 billion euros uh, through, uh, uh, through uh, aggressive tax planning, tax havens, etc. And of that, about 64 billion euros is, to, is lost in uh, VAT. Is it going to go? It's not going to go. Oh, there it is. So, in Poland itself, uh, uh, in 2015, our uh, VAT gap was about 27%. Now, over four years, uh, we've managed to reduce that uh, uh, gap uh, down, to, uh, uh, down to about 9, 9.5%. And, and in fact, a report in today's Polish paper by Ernst and Young says that's probably the limits of the, uh, that we, what we can achieve going down to 9%, because we're, we're talking about business to business uh, uh, VAT fraud, where we have tax carousels, etc. Uh, the 9% which is left is basically uh, business to consumer or consumer to business uh, gray area, uh, which we have to work on. Now, how do we do that? Uh, we implemented uh, uh, various uh, things. It, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't just one thing that we did. Uh, we, we changed the law, we, we re-engineered uh, the, the tax authorities to give them uh, 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 more information. We brought in uh, split payments, which uh, <laughs> means that uh, VAT payments were split, uh, the, the tax was paid to an account which was no longer uh, available for uh, payments uh, to, the, uh, the, to the seller uh, of, of the products or services. Uh, we brought in, uh, uh, in our national clearing uh, house uh, a program we called STEER, which is basically analyzing payments to see if there is uh, uh, some uh, uh, interesting logic in the companies which have just started up are making, uh, uh, issuing big invoices and, and receiving big payments. Uh, one of the consequences, of course, of, uh, of uh, um, addressing the, the VAT gap is that because more and more VAT is actually paid, uh, the companies which are paying the VAT also have to register uh, their income, which means they make uh, bigger profits, uh, legal profits, which of course has a knock-on effect on the uh, corporate tax and, the, and their personal income tax. So over the last three years, uh, as a consequence of uh, clamping down on, on the VAT fraud, we've actually also increased uh, our corporate ta tax by, by uh, uh, over 50%. Okay. Now, we are, we are offering a, 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 a solidarity a, a campaign that uh, if we all have a common goal, we all sh should have solidarity in achieving it, which I can't uh, re really say that's uh, true about uh, a country to the EU at the moment. Because Poland isn't, isn't uh, an island. Uh, Poland is part of the EU. So if we've won the, the battle, I'm not saying if we actually won the war, uh, on the VAT fraud in Poland. All that means is that the, the people, uh, the mafia which are, uh, are creating the frauds have actually moved to other countries in Europe. And we need to work together to actually eliminate them. One country on their own can't just eliminate uh, VAT fraud. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, we should be all working together. 
which actually implements uh, some of the best practice, uh, uh, some of the practices that we've implemented in Poland, as I said, so split payments, the steer payments, uh, online uh, uh, fiscal registers, etc. If they work in uh, Warsaw, they can also work in Rome, in Madrid, or, or in Paris. Similarly, uh, other countries are also implementing um, uh, various uh, projects to limit uh, the loss on, on uh, VAT fraud. Spain and I Italy have implemented e-invoicing. Uh, Croatia has uh, imp implemented uh, cash uh, online cash registers. Now, these, uh, these are all examples of countries doing something on their own where we should actually be working uh, t together. So, Poland's uh, offering to the table uh, a, a solidarity uh, uh, in, in the fight against uh, tax. I think if we work together and share our best practices, we'll be able to, do, to implement a lot, lot more. Now, this isn't uh, in, in, instead of what the EU is doing. EU's been working on uh, tax evasion and uh, over uh, probably more than 10 years now. What we're looking at is to provide uh, something which is complementary to what the EU is doing. So uh, unfortunately, EU, do you have unanimity, which excludes some of the things uh, which uh, uh, we'd like to implement. So here we're offering to work together and provide sort of bilateral, multilateral agreements so we can attack some of these uh, uh, processes in, in, in tax fraud. For a start, um, the EU uh, looks at various countries around the world and assesses them whether they're tax havens. We also think the EU should be uh, assessing uh, uh, countries within the EU. Are they not uh, uh, tax havens under different names? Um, companies which are either based or are leveraging uh, um, uh, tax havens in Europe should also be assessed, and uh, which we should uh, literally, uh, if, if uh, ban these sort of companies from uh, participating in, uh, in public tender. Uh, open data is now that we should force uh, uh, companies which are working in, in Europe, or multinational companies, to actually show us their uh, tax strategies. Uh, and also for tax authorities to, to share data between themselves so that we can uh, uh, clamp down on, on the companies which are leveraging tax havens. Tax authorities uh, should uh, also be, be rating uh, should be rating companies which are, uh, are working uh, or leveraging tax havens so that we can see uh, uh, companies that should be eliminated from uh, public tenders and, and uh, uh, as they move around for, from country to country. Um, the EU should be empowered to actually impose sanctions on uh, EU countries uh, as well, which are actually uh, performing uh, uh, the business of uh, tax havens. Uh, companies should be uh, uh, um, uh, forced to recalculate their tax base, a bit like the uh, American uh, uh, base erosion uh, anti-abuse uh, tax base, that they, they should recalculate their tax, uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, extracting or putting back rather payments which they've made for, uh, for interest, for, for uh, dividend payments, to see if they're not moving too much money to, to tax havens. Uh, digital tax is another uh, uh, tax where uh, we should be uh, speeding up. The OECD should speed up. Uh, it's taken a long time. It's, it's causing a problem that uh, some countries should be uh, um, impatient in implementing their own um, a digital tax, which is only going to cause uh, a problem in the future that uh, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, digital tax shopping. So global companies will see where the uh, lowest tax are and, and, and start competing uh, between us. Uh, not enough is being done on cash. Cash is a tremendous cost for our economies. Uh, in Poland, over 1.3% well, 1 of our GDP every year is lost to, 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 to cash. That's how much it costs the cash. That's a, a World Bank uh, uh, assessment and a, and, a, and a Polish National Bank. I think we should be doing a lot more. Uh, we're talking about the environment, etc. Well, who's actually looking how many trees we cut uh, uh, cut down to create bank banknotes? And also the inefficiency uh, of that. And that's also fueling uh, the grey economy. So uh, Poland is offering uh, cooperation. It's uh, also offering a blood, sweat and tears, as Winston said. But at the end of the day, uh, there's an awful lot of money uh, to, to that we, there's 170 billion euros in Poland, in, in Europe every year, which we can have access to. Thanks very much.
Uh, thank you, Minister. That was a lot of uh, slides and a few wonderful pictures, I have to say. I mean, I loved, for example, the tax um, haven, uh, paradise, the Euro uh, island. That was uh, was was beautiful picture. Thank you for for this uh, very interesting presentation. Perhaps I just take one or two uh, quick questions um, and then we move to the panel. Who would like to ask a question? Herr Geisert. Thank you, uh, Mr. Minister. I am Kurt Geisert, uh, one of the guides in the House of European History. You encouraged me to ask one question about history. Uh, the Hitler-Stalin Pact was signed uh, some weeks before the attack uh, against Poland uh, in September uh, 39. In how much do you think uh, did it encourage this attack? Thank you. Did it uh, uh, well encourage? Uh, whether the Hitler-Stalin Pact encouraged war, how, how much did it encourage uh, the attack against Poland? So, so, uh, hundred, so can hundred. we collect the question? I mean, it's not really a question related to the text <laughs> question. Uh, so but we, it's an we interesting take, question. We take a second. Um, Todd Buell, I'm a tax journalist with Law360, and I was very interested in your comment about how, if I understood you correctly, that the EU should consider putting on its blacklist other EU countries. I'm wondering if, I, if you could be a little more specific and say which EU countries you think should be on this blacklist. Thank you. Hello, Olivier Flinterman from the Dutch Permanent Representation. I noticed that some of the solutions offered to counter tax havens might be at stress with fiscal sovereignty. Would Poland be willing to give up its fiscal sovereignty in order to fight tax havens, such as a minimum tax for corporate income taxation? Okay, so 110% was the answer to you. <laughs> um, so, uh, also, no, uh, the, the answer to the third was, uh, uh, no, I don't think uh, uh, it's, it's, I think the core of uh, uh, the EU is that countries have fiscal sovereignty. So I'm not certain that Poland would want to uh, uh, reduce that. And we're not asking for that. Uh, I think this is really the, uh, uh, why we want bilateral, multilateral uh, uh, agreements so that we don't actually have to lose our, our fiscal sovereignty because fiscal sovereignty is very, very important to the way to uh, manage your uh, domestic uh, uh, economies. Um, and uh, which countries? I think uh, it's, it's, uh, we don't have to name names. Uh, I think everybody can c calculate which countries are getting the most in, uh, in interest and in, in dividends and, uh, uh, and have the lowest uh, corporate tax. I think it's a, a no-brainer there. If you just uh, look at those two uh, issues, you'll quickly see who is uh, uh, a potential tax haven. Okay, thank you very much. I think these, these answers were clear enough. Um, thank, thank you so much. And uh, we can now, I think, move to, uh, to our panel discussion. And let me invite uh, Maria Teresa and uh, Piotr to the stage. And let's give a big thanks to the minister. And I think we have a third um, a panelist um, online, uh, Agnès Benassi-Queré um, from the University of Paris, who's also uh, a senior fellow here at Bruegel and is actually today joining us from her holidays. Thank you, Agnès, for, for being with us today. Um, and um, hi. Um, and, and perhaps I thought we start this conversation perhaps with, uh, with Piotr, um, because Piotr, you're, you're from Poland and you've studied um, the um, the issue of um, tax fraud and tax evasion in quite some detail um, and have studied also the Polish experience. And as the minister has also explained, an, a, an important element in, um, in combating tax fraud is digitalization. And um, of course, it's noticeable that Poland has advanced quite a bit in terms of e-government, e-invoicing, and so on and so forth. And I was wondering whether you could Give us uh, your take on, you know, how, uh, what is the recipe? I mean, how much did Poland really uh, reduce tax fraud? Um, and how did it do so? And how important was the digitalization in that? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for the question. Um, you know, 
I'm not a tax guy. I was uh, actually I had to learn uh, a lot about taxation when I, I started my work because uh, we had many reforms happening uh, in the country, uh, to, which were interesting from uh, you know from um, uh, by uh, bystander points of, points of view because uh, you know the companies the businesses didn't like it because a lot of tax law changed throughout the year. Uh, but it was because uh, uh, Poland was lagging behind, lagging behind uh, a lot of EU countries in terms of uh, implementation of of uh, new proposals, uh, implementation of anti laundering directives too. So this is a lot of things that didn't uh, didn't check uh, up until 2015, and we saw a lot of um, uh, new. Uh, innovative ideas in Portugal, for example, or in, uh, in other non-EU countries where they had innovation in terms of how to implement tax policy, to think about behavioral economics, what to do with the people, how to, to make them you know, comply with the law and not break the law, even unwillingly, for example, because a lot of the, the stuff that happens with VAT is also an element of error. Those are the people who make the bad decisions in terms of how they put in the invoice and then we see something in the system that is broken down. But yeah, that's the main issue. We don't have a system. Uh, uh, and this is uh, something that uh, I think uh, uh, was one of the, the uh, uh, biggest innovations is to have a more centralized uh, in a, a system of data gathering uh, by the state on um, uh, on invoices, for example, and actually on about what is happening in the in the uh, in the published business each year, because if you see all the invoices, invoices, um, you can uh, dig in the data, you can analyze it as a true audit office, um, and see what's happening and what's happening, which which is fraud, uh, something which is happening. Um, it shouldn't be there, and this is, I think, the biggest innovations. At this Poland wasn't the first country. Portugal was one of the first to implement a, um, a central analytical service, uh, but um, uh, uh, Portugal implemented it, buying it from a big American corporation. I won't bring up the name, uh, not to give advertisements, but we had to create it on our own, not to give, you know, to know what's behind the system not to have just a black box that adjusts itself with the additional information coming from the law that is being changed. So uh, this was something challenging, to have IT people work, uh, to have hackathons on taxation, uh, and to have young people be interested actually in taxes uh, because it was a problem. And IT young people, you know, this is not something which which you see very common, Main, more often in, I don't know, big four companies. Um, and um, uh, this is this is something I find uh, uh, what was most innovative, and what we saw then uh, when the da data came in back. So uh, as an analyst, seeing what's happening with the Polish business, what was interesting that the take up on technology usage, and using uh, because the new systems were put in place, you had to give your data provided with in a digital form in a one single file that is being uh, comparable with other country with other businesses. Mm, and the companies uh, started to use more uh, not pen and paper uh, systems of, of um, uh, um, uh, doing their taxes, uh, but started to use more technology-wise. And this is something which we saw. Poland is, is not a you know, champion in terms of the digital sphere. Uh, we're, maybe we do some good uh, uh, games, basically. One, one you might hear them. But uh, based on a book, actually. So this is we also, you know, we have some novelists in Poland too, uh, which the minister didn't cover. Uh, uh, but um, um, uh, so uh, what was what was really interesting is that uh, um, the 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 take up of innovative technologies by the companies was nurtured by the new tax solutions that they had to use. So we saw companies use more technology, technological solutions because of the, uh, the, the need of the state to be more uh, digital. Because typical companies and also those companies that, that did digital fraud, they wanted to use more, uh, more or less cash. Uh, they also exchanged B2B uh, on cash. Um, uh, it's not something unseen, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago to have uh, uh, someone paying for their invoice in a bag of cash. 
so it's not unheard of. It's unheard of in Western Europe. Uh, but that, that was something that was uh, happening uh, business-wise, uh, typically. Now it's uh, something from the past, I think. Uh, and what we see from the, uh, from the analysis uh, published today uh, by Ernst & Young in, in Poland, uh, I also read it on the, on the plane, um, is that there is almost no room to, uh, to adjust the system internally. So we, we, we reached the average level of the VAT gap in Poland, uh, average level uh, at the EU level. Uh, so we're an, uh, a country that was an outlier, now we're an average economy in terms of how many frauds are being conducted or errors, because they're, they're, they calculate mm. both in the system. And um, the next step is basically go international. Uh, this is something where you need more cooperation, uh, you need to exchange more information uh, about uh, what is happening in your system. You need to gather data on the uh, businesses that uh, take part in some of the countries which are more, I would say, liberal in terms of their uh, tax compliance level or the, uh, the information that is being gathered by the tax authorities. And we need to uh, adjust that. Um, the problem is, of course, unanimity, as, as the minister uh, Koszczynski pointed out. Uh, but there are many other solutions that could be uh, implemented uh, thanks to international cooperation uh, of those countries who want to cooperate. And there's a majority of those, I think, in Europe uh, who have an issue with, with what is happening, uh, happening in the internal market. And, uh, the, uh, and the issue on the next level is what the OECD is going to um, recommend. Because, uh, once again, OECD doesn't have any authority to make anybody implement their regulations, uh, which is also an issue. As the taxes is an internal policy, we need to find those who want to exchange information, want to cooperate. Uh, the base erosion system, which is in the States, is, is, is something probably that would have to be on the EU level uh, uh, in order to be introduced. But uh, I think you're going to talk about that a bit. Um, uh, but there are many solutions in place, and just use one. And if we have so much money you lost due to uh, rich people uh, going abroad with their money, uh, through corporations which uh, push and optimize uh, their money, and we also have still fraud uh, in terms of VAT on the international level, uh, although we don't, so this could come back anytime soon, so you know, uh, people, the mafia tends to learn mm. a lot, uh, and they, they also sure. go digital. So, so Piotr, Piotr you, uh, you mentioned Poland has now reached the average uh, level. Um, now you, uh, and I forgot to mention, you are the director of the Polish Economic Institute, and you, you have published a report also in which you showed how much the, um, uh, the uh, tax collection has actually increased thanks to becoming average, what you said, average in terms of uh, the VAT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so... Can, can you just give us quickly the, the headline number that your study came, came out with? Yeah, so, uh, for example, the VAT gap uh, uh, decreased from 25 or 26 percent uh, in 2012 till, um, till last year was nine and a half. So it was, uh, this is the hypothetical level of the VAT that is to be collected by any uh, uh, tax authority. So this is uh, now uh, below the EU average of uh, approximately 10 or 12 percent. Uh, so, so this so is almost... 10 percent is not collected? Even yeah, not be collected, collected, not okay, collected, so because this is... all. you were 28 and now yeah, we're was, Yeah, yeah, so oh, we, we were at 26 percent. So more than one-fourth of the taxes were not collected internally. Uh, you didn't see that in many countries. So this was a true problem, and uh, we've seen, like, you know, I, 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 I grew up in Poland in the 90s, and I, I saw mafia people, you know, mobsters doing lots of different stuff, and uh, they went to prison. They came back in 2000, and uh, at the beginning of 2000s, after the sentences ended, and they actually started uh, businesses on the single market, which uh, sold invoices. Uh, throughout the European Union. And this is something that they learned from the UK. <laughs> uh, so, uh, because the UK had, was the first country that had a lot of uh, carousels. So this became a, a, um, like a national sport of sorts.
Thank you. Um, let's now perhaps turn to uh, the European Commission. We already heard uh, that we need um, European solutions to uh, to get better in closing the, the VAT gap. And so uh, we are delighted to have today Maria Teresa Fabregas Fernandez, Director for Indirect Taxation and Tax Administration at the DG Tax Suit of the European Commission. So you are really the expert and the specialist on this topic. Can you uh, walk us through what the Commission is currently doing in this space and what you think should come next? Thank you. Thank you. No, first of all, I would like to, to thank the Minister and also Piotr no, for the data that you are bringing to the table because you are raising awareness to uh, something that sometimes for normal citizens is not known. And the link, for instance, the Minister mentioned in the slides about uh, uh, the reduction of VAT gap make it also better for corporate taxation and other types of taxes, uh, it, it's clear. So on this, we all fully agree on the fact that um, it's very important to, to be able to reduce this gap uh, in terms of what should be the tax uh, revenue collected and what is really collected. So in this regard, in the last college under our President Juncker Commission, um, the European Commission reacted to many tax scandals mm, that were already highlighting the issue of uh, carousel frauds and other types of scandals you know, on direct taxation. And that's why um, we put on the table proposals that many were adopted, but not all. But one of the proposals that was adopted was precisely in order to strengthen administrative cooperation between member states, tax administrations, to use technology, uh, for instance, uh, to use uh, what we call transaction network analysis, so algorithms that our experts in, uh, in the tax administrations are using pre precisely in order to, to cut some of the carousel frauds. And uh, also at the end of um, last year, the Council adopted the legislation on payment data uh, to link it to, to the e-commerce because the VAT e-commerce also legislation was updated in order to avoid this, uh, this uh, lack of uh, uh, kind of VAT in some of the e-commerce transactions. So it's clear that we have done a lot, but it's clear also that a lot needs to be done. And one of the main proposals that it's still on the table of the Council, and I see many fiscal attaches uh, in, the, in the audience, um, is still on the table is the what we call the definitive regime. Hmm? The kind of legal mechanism that uh, we from the Commission side consider that would uh, stop uh, the, the carousel fraud to, to continue within the single market. Negotiations are very difficult. The file, uh, well, it's, it's frozen in a way. And in this regard also, the European Commission in December organized an event called V18 in the Digital Age, precisely in order to explore some other measures. And the minister mentioned one of these measures, which is the e-invoicing. Uh, so there were some tax administrations explaining how they had introduced the invoicing, others uh, uh, kind of also transaction-based reporting. And uh, we consider that it's key to make sure that we make use of technology in order to help uh, reducing all this fraud. So this is in a way on the, on the VAT side, uh, but uh, in the framework of um, direct taxation, corporate taxation in particular, as mentioned, uh, there are many problems too. And uh, in the digital taxation field, where we in the European Commission, we put two proposals on the table, one on direct taxation, the other on indirect taxation. Now the negotiations in the Council are frozen because the main effort is at the OECD G20 level in order to uh, bring forward a global solution because uh, we prefer first uh, to have global solutions and then if they do not work, we will have to look at the European ones. And this is uh, in, the, um, in the mandate of the current president of the commission, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, and the mission letters of my commissioner, Commissioner Gentiloni, and other the relevant uh, vice presidents. It's clear that uh, it, there is an issue, both on what we are talking first on VAT taxation uh, fraud and on, on corporate and linked to the digital, uh, taxation that we will have to solve. But first, uh, it's the, the, the global level in the corporate side. Uh, on VAT, we have to work at European level. And um, as the minister highlighted, in Europe we have unanimity, which makes things uh, complex and uh, difficult. However, we try uh, to be 
as um, proactive from our side, from the European Commission, in order to allow member states to exchange these best practices, in order to work together, in order to find uh, the right solutions. And in this regard, it was two years ago when we also, from the European Commission, thanks to member states uh, willing to do that, we launched a network of the heads of tax administrations within the EU, where they are exchanging best practices, they are trying to work together in order to uh, find proper solutions to the same challenges they are facing. Because at the end of the day, as you very well explained, uh, the minister and Piotr, it's clear that there is a limit on what a member state by its own can do. Because we are in an interconnected economy in within the single market, but beyond the single market. And therefore, uh, it's necessary to make efforts together. Um, what I would like uh, also to highlight is the fact that um, when we put legislation in the table, it's difficult to have the, it adopted because of the unanimity, but we managed to have some legislation adopted. And what is key now is to make sure that all member states, all tax administrations implement this legislation, because this is also one of the, of the key issues we have within the European Union, when um, sometimes not all member states are implementing the legislation. And it's key that member states implement legislation, meaning also that governments have to provide the necessary resources to tax administrations to provide it. Poland is an example where this was done. And uh, as mentioned also by Piotr, it, it uh, turned out to be very successful also for the Polish startups and digital companies in order to help uh, the government, the tax administration to build uh, in uh, all the technology required to combat fraud. So as you see, it's not an easy thing to do uh, because many actors have to be uh, working together. And, uh, but we are here in order to help and it's clear in the mandate of this new commission, a clear message for us, the civil servants, is to bring forward new initiatives, uh, new uh, networks, new processes in order to make sure that um, the gap uh, is reduced. Thank, thank you very much, Marie, Maria Teresa. P perhaps let me ask you one, one follow-up question, which is um, uh, related, of course, uh, let's focus on, to be more specific, on the VAT tax carousels, right? And so, so you mentioned we need global solutions, but then you also, and I think, Piotr, you also mentioned that, you also made clear that there seems to be some sort of a single market dimension. So in the single market, in the EU, this is particularly a problem and can be in particular ways be, uh, be a problem and so needs a specific EU solution. So, so can you say a bit more what specifically we can do at the EU level? Because, I mean, the global level, I mean, waiting for the global level m m might mean waiting for another 10 years or 20 years, right? I mean, so, so is, isn't this really an issue that is a single market uh, connected issue? And can you also explain whether it is a single market issue and then how to, how to fix it really? Yes, sorry, on the global level, what is now under discussion is the corporate uh, tax uh, debate. Right. And the solution should be by the end of this year huh, at global level, okay. <laughs> because then we have to implement it. So, so that's the global, on the digital taxation, yeah. exactly. On VAT, I fully agree with you, it's a single market issue. If, even if mm -hmm. I have to tell you that uh, at the OECD level, they are uh, looking very attentively what we are doing in Europe with VAT because they are taking some of our general principles of the EU VAT to the, to the global level. But VAT is a, is, a, is a new issue, single market issue, and that's why uh, the European Commission presented uh, in 2018 a proposal on what we call the definitive regime because the problem comes from the current EU legal framework. Mm -hmm. This carousel fraud um, it's not that it's allowed because it's not allowed, but there are some loopholes in the current legal framework that make it uh, too easy for the fraudsters to, and these mafias, because they are mafias, and uh, journalists have proof that some of these mafias are even financing terrorism. So um, it's, a, it's a big problem, but we put on the table a proposal, legislative proposal, which is in the council, um, which was, the intention was really to change this legal framework and to make a more uh, single market uh, VAT legislation, but uh, the council it's it's blocked for the moment. So the negotiation is not advancing, and that's why um, at this stage uh, we are looking at other possible options by the use of new technologies. And the minister himself in, in the slides uh, mentioned some of the possible uh, ways to look at the issues. No, because it's data that 
does exist in tax administration, so how can this data be better shared? Uh, how can you know, invoicing uh, be used? The cash registrars, for example, in, in, in Croatia, split payment in Poland, other member states are using same same type of uh, procedures. And, um, and the kind of, hopefully in, in not so long future, real-time reporting huh, in order to have access to all this information. But I agree with what uh, the minister said that um, there is a moment where the, what the national government and tax administration can do in order to uh, eliminate the tax fraud, being direct taxation and indirect taxation, cannot be done in isolation because the interconnections are there. And sometimes, as today, unfortunately, the VAT directive that just today um, creates the, some uh, easier way for the carousel fraud to happen. And that's what we need uh, all together to, to stop. Thank you. Um, let's now turn to uh, to you, Agnes. I hope you can still hear us. Um, uh, wonderful. We can hear you also very well. Um, and yes, uh, you've listened to three presentations. What what are your first reactions? Um, a major reform of the tax administration in 2017, 
or whatever. The merger between uh, customer services, uh, fiscal control, and the cash administration itself. So I was wondering uh, what what uh, lessons can be drawn from that, because um, if we want to raise the level of mutual, mutual trust, maybe one idea would be to make national tax administration more independent, make them independent agencies for indirect levies, not for direct taxation, but for indirect taxation. Why am I saying this? Because uh, these administrations have a very narrow, well-defined mandate. There is a lot of uh, complexity, it's very technical. Uh, the decisions uh, may be of uh, judicial uh, nature. There are big international spillovers, and there is a risk of political lobbying. So all the conditions for making a tax administration in uh, in independent agencies are here. It's a bit like uh, in the uh, competition policy. Uh, we have a network of independent national policies uh, for competition policies. Uh, there are, it's a double layer with the EU, uh, the Commission, and uh, for uh, small cases, it's at the national level. So I was wondering whether creating such a network could be instrumental in accompanying uh, the move towards uh, uh, the basement rule regime of uh, the EU. And then I was asking myself about possible expansions of all these achievements and how to emulate these reforms in other areas. And one area that comes to my mind is a social fraud. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, cross-border social fraud. We know that uh, all the debates about uh, posted workers, actually, it's mostly about fraud, not about the system itself. So how to, um, to fight this fraud? Uh, I think it's very important uh, from a social point of view. Uh, we would need, ideally, a common database for EU workers that, again, can be crossed other countries to have access to personal data because basically we have in this database uh, the social number of uh, each worker and whether the contributions have been paid and who uh, and which uh, company did pay uh, the contribution and ideally we would like to connect such database to uh, business registers to see whether the company still exists for instance and this is something I think uh, that is impossible because we cannot merge a business register with a social uh, database. So I was wondering whether maybe uh, uh, my method is I could have something to say about this. Then maybe quickly on the corporate income tax and uh, personal income tax. Um, so we know uh, the uh, DEPS proposal. When I read the DEPS proposal, I can hardly understand why a country uh, should be against that in, in terms of loss of sovereignty. Which sovereignty are we talking about? when um, Finland 2 proposes a 12.5% minimum wage. So there is no change in any country. All countries have at least 12.5% uh, um, rate of uh, corporate income tax. So, so I'm a bit puzzled about uh, the debate. And then the question for the EU is what is the product? So it officially is the uh, so-called CCCTV, um, but um, another uh, possibility would be a mixture of the, the so-called uh, significant visible physical presence uh, for EU countries uh, and a revision of the interest and royalties directive to uh, tax uh, a minimum, impose a minimum tax on outbound, outbound uh, payments and also a uh, revision of the, control, the, the directive for uh, TFCs uh, controlled foreign companies in order to implement a minimum tax on inbound of profits made by these CFTs. So uh, I think maybe the EU could also design a package that would be a fallback if the text doesn't work, if the CCTV is too difficult, and then we have another solution, which is after <laughs> several uh, mm. things to propose. And now and I would like just to say a word about the personal income tax. Uh, we have done well, very little on this area, which is uh, national sovereignty. Uh, they have a, there was a big step with the automatic exchange of information. However, I wanted to flag today the fact that uh, top personal income taxes, uh, top term, uh, PIT rates uh, range from uh, more than 57% in Sweden uh, to 10% uh, in Bulgaria and Romania, 15% in Hungary, uh, in Poland it's 32%, 47% uh, in Italy. According to Eurostat in um, 
uh, in a recent uh, year, uh, disposable income per household in current euros for the, say, the ninth decile of Poland, in, in, of the Polish uh, population, was around 12,000 12, euros. Hence, it's the same level as the first decile in Italy. So it means that 20% of the Italians uh, were earning less than the top 10% in current euros. I'm not talking for that, on the top of that have been considering prices. For Hungary, it's the, well, the top PIT rate is 15%, the figure is 20%. So it means that 20% of Italian households had an income of less than the top decile of the Hungarian household who were taxed at a marginal rate of 15%. So uh, we are not going to, to, to change this, uh, but I think that if we start thinking about what will happen when the 20% um, uh, poor Italians households uh, become unhappy to finance transfer to Hungary if the local wealthy people uh, pay only 15% at the margin, top marginal rate. So this discussion has not started in the EU. Uh, there is a discussion in the US about the wealth tax. And I would be surprised that it never got the attention. And uh, so I, I think there needs to be a discussion about the progressivity of the personal income tax, keeping the sovereignty of each country uh, in mind. And uh, well, I will stop here. I wanted just mm. to say a thing about the cash cash economy because, uh, so coming back to fraud, um, I wanted to mention that the fraud on credit cards is much larger than the, than the fraud on state banknotes. So I'm not sure that getting rid of cash would magically eliminate uh, the fraud. And uh, we need to think about welfare, not about just about uh, tax revenues. And if we have a damage in terms of social inclusion, if we have a damage in, in terms of resilience, what would happen if we have a power blackout? What would happen hmm. if we have a large scale hacking? Uh, so the, the banknotes actually are a piece of uh, resilience of the system, I was just wanted to mention it. The objective, uh, the, the final objective, is not to just to close the cash loopholes, it's a welfare. Thank, thank you, and yes, uh, this was uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, very, very interesting points and food for thought and uh, good points for discussion. Uh, of course, I, I noted that um, uh, you know, tax still uh, uh, t cash is still seen as something uh, positive, at least um, uh, for emergency uh, circumstances. So I think that that's that's a nice a nice point to make, um, and I'm sure many people will will enjoy that point very much. That already think we should get rid of cash completely, also so that monetary policy can run its its course f fully into negative territory. But that's another debate. Um, so we had, a, a, I think, a very rich presentation on solidarity was one aspect. We had a, some technical questions, uh, Piotr, to you on uh, on um, on the VAT specifically and, and how, how you did it really and what component was, uh, how important. And we had quite a bit also, I think, uh, addressed to the commission in terms of you know the, how how to make it make it happen. What's the package here? And perhaps also a bit on the corporate side, the corporate uh, the, um, tax, and including this question of shouldn't we have um, tax um, tax uh, collection offices um, that work in a network and are more or less independent uh, from from the finance ministry, at least when it comes to the VAT. And of course, we would love to have an official position of the European <laughs> Commission on this. Um, so, Piotr, perhaps you want to take a few of those. Okay. Uh, so, thank you very much for the for the question and, and uh, interesting remarks. And um, uh, of course, the the easiest answer, but the most sincere one too, is that uh, the the most important issue was taking uh, the VAT matter to a political level. So it what we did it wasn't just a technical. Uh, matter that was uh, connected with what what the finance minister was doing, but it was one of the strongest goals of the whole administration. And uh, what the, the previous administrations did is they increased, for example, the marginal tax uh, uh, level. So they increased the, uh, the VAT level by one percentage point in 2011, and they didn't see 
Uh, so you, we saw a decrease in the level of the, the VAT that was collected by the tax authorities. They increased uh, the, tax, uh, the tax rate, but they didn't see any additional inflow of uh, cash because of the increase of the tax rate. So uh, this was like um, uh, a semi-professional way of, of dealing with the, with the matter, is to to have it on the you know uh, have it on the um, uh, have a flag, wave it around about tax uh, the taxes that this is b being a real and true matter, uh, and this is I think the same thing for European Union. As long as we talk about it, as long as we uh, have discussions about how to reform uh, taxes in the EU. As long as we speak, we publicize, we uh, take this uh, to the matter that there are some people who uh, commit uh, acts which are fraudulent uh, in the European Union. As long as those people tend to get scared about this matter because you talk about it. It's not you know, uh, somewhere in the, ha in the shadow, it's somewhere that you, you pointed out as a matter which is important for the political life. So uh, I, I think it wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be able to reform the system that much if it wasn't for the uh, waving the flag around uh, by politicians saying that this is an important matter. And I know that this is one of the first and the most important recommendations that the IMF had. So so as long as you have a lot of press conferences and you speak about the ma uh, tax fraud and you you know you have some guys that are going to jail because they uh, they took I don't know two million of uh, two million Polish water or euros uh, out of the taxpayers' money uh, and this is a moment where okay. Uh, let's, you know, TiVo that and, uh, honey, let's think about our business model right now. So uh, if, I, if, if me, me and my mates are going, doing the right thing right now of uh, uh, committing this, this kind of uh, uh, stuff. And um, it's, it's uh, the trust matter with the tax authorities, different tax authorities in the European Union is a re really important issue. Uh, so I know uh, from, from the people working in the Polish tax authorities, uh, that they have, uh, they have had. Pro they, they cannot say it out loud, but I know that they had problems in uh, cooperation with ad uh, with different tax administrations in the EU. So uh, they had uh, problems in exchange of knowledge about companies that are registered in a different European uh, tax jurisdiction, and um, it's it's something that uh, you know. Uh, uh, a lot of red tape is, for example, being created when you ask questions about someone's dealings. And it takes a lot of time when the person, uh, you know, the, the, the administration or the services cannot uh, pursue the person who probably committed some kind of crime. So this, this is something uh, truly important. That's why the, 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 um, the, uh, the underlinement on, on, on tax cooperation. So on the exchange of knowledge, I don't think we're gonna get anytime soon to the moment where we're gonna have one of our you know codes in one of the systems exchange all the data connected with the ta security systems and the tax systems. This is something maybe in the matrix. Uh, although the matrix, in the, if you if you watch the movie, was placed at the beginning of the 2000s, so uh, we're past behind the the the, the schedule. Uh, but I think we would, uh, that would, uh, uh, a lot of those countries, and I, I also uh, am speaking about Poland, need a lot of internal reforms in terms of uh, data exchanges. We are still not that good as Denmark, uh, Sweden, uh, in terms of the usage of data, or Netherlands even, of the usage of data which is governed, um, uh, gathered by the state in different types and spheres. So the social security systems don't always uh, interact with the tax system because they are independent. And if, as different limbs with different brains, uh, they don't uh, always go in hand in hand and cooperate on, on matters uh, uh, truly important. And uh, the other issue which, uh, um, which you point out about the dependence of, uh, of tax authorities, and this is also was one of the crucial points in the reform that was placed in Poland. So we had different agencies they were um, uh, um, joined, so we had the synergy effects of the same people working on the same matter and also some of them you know, having the, the possibility to, to possess guns 
and go out through 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 uh, through the naughty taxpayers' offices. Uh, but they uh, they um, uh, but that was it's an independent agency. It's outside of the Ministry of Finance, although the head of the, the agency is the Deputy Minister of Finance and head of the tax administration. So they have their own ranks, they got generals, and, and you know it's a different kind of branch of services uh, 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 currently. And this is something probably as the competitive authorities. This is something which works better if you have those people who can have a career, have a um, uh, different system of um, uh, um, advancing their career inside the, the tax administration and also to get paid a bit more. Uh, this is also important <laughs> to have bureaucrats who are not underpaid if, they wanna, if you want them to uh, 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 do their job properly. Yes, so here uh, what Piotr said about uh, uh, the main thing in a country in order to reduce tax fraud is to have the political backing and to have it as a priority, as a goal for the government, I think it's key. Because um, one of the key issues is to have the necessary resources, and here we go to, to staff, to, to human beings, but also to the personnel, but also to all the necessary investments uh, in IT in order to, to make this change happen. Therefore, it's clear that um, uh, without political backing at national level, uh, it's difficult to implement uh, such a kind of program as it was done in Poland and other member states are doing in order to combat fraud. So on this, uh, I fully agree. Uh, then at the European level, as said, uh, we are trying during this uh, term of the, of the current commission to, to work uh, with the member states in order to, to help member states to work better together. This is the, the goal of the Tadeus, the network of the tax, uh, heads of tax administrations, but also in order to put on the table the right proposals, legislative proposals, that will provide this possibility to have more access to data, to better uh, exchange data. And as said, no, last year there was this proposal on, the, on what we call VAT payment data, which is linked to the e-commerce payment data. Uh, but unfortunately, well, it was adopted last year, and formally it will be tomorrow, but um, unfortunately the implementation will be 2025. Yeah. So be why? Because member states, they say that they need time in order to implement uh, all these changes in the IT tax administrations. So it takes time. Uh, to combat fraud takes time, and uh, well, we have to work together, uh, and this is crucial, in order to, to make sure that all member states go in the right direction. And in this regard, uh, from the European Commission side, there are uh, new programs such as the Structural Reform Support uh, Program that helps also member states in order to, to get some financing to help them in their uh, fight uh, against fraud. And, um, and, and this is uh, important to be taken into consideration. When uh, we were talking about, um, uh, Agnes mentioned the, the question about independent agencies, yes or no. Well, uh, my before joining taxation area in the European Commission, I joined three years ago, I spent 12 years in the financial services legislation area, and they are, well, the securities markets authorities, they are independent, so I, I saw different types of authorities, and now that I'm working in tax suit, uh, we have taxation and customs, I see also different types of design at member states level in terms of how taxation and customs is dealt with. In some administrations it goes together and this creates good synergies also to combat fraud hmm? because when we're talking about uh, international no, market, uh, uh, customs uh, plays a role. And, um, and what is clear is that from the commission side, the answer is what we want is tax administrations that have the necessary human resources and the necessary resources in order to combat fraud with the, with the right mandate uh, in order to combat fraud. So that's, uh, that's what is important. Then Agnes mentioned a question that uh, she addressed it to me directly uh, concerning this possible databases, a change of, it was in the framework of social uh, security fraud, a changing of data between different platforms. What is clear is that 
from the European Commission side, when we present new legislative proposals for new tools to exchange more data, we have always to take into consideration and to take into account the data protection rules. As you know, we need to make sure that uh, the rules <coughs> are proportionate. And therefore, that's why, I mean, we managed to have this uh, piece of legislation I was mentioning on VAT payment data adopted, but it's in a proportionate manner. Therefore, it's always uh, necessary at national level, at European level, to take into consideration the, the data protection rules. And then, well, the discussion about cash, uh, no cash, uh, uh, I know that in some member states, because I've been traveling around, uh, there are already today some shops where they say no cash. Huh? So uh, kind of the private initiative in some member states, uh, it does exist. Uh, whether the solution is uh, to go from analog to digital completely, well, you know, also there are lots of discussions about uh, possibilities of using new, new technologies such as blockchain, where the data I mean, is, is completely uh, secure or contracts would be fixed forever. Um, yeah, well, new technologies provide uh, new ways of looking at things. And what is important is that legislation doesn't stay in the Middle Ages, uh, because I can tell you that when we talk about legislation, even corporate legislation, our legislation is based on principles of the 19th century. Yeah? We're in the 21st century. Uh, therefore, it's necessary to change. No. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's really necessary to make sure from our side, European Commission, that the legislation is up to date. And that's why we are trying to work with member states and helping uh, organizing these conferences in order to bring uh, new expertise and, if necessary, to bring new proposals on the table. Wonderful. Let's take a, a few questions um, at the end. Um, so if, if someone would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and tell me also to whom you address it. The gentleman here. Over here, maybe two mics. Okay. Thank you. My name is Jean-Pierre Delat. I'm from the University of Brussels and worked in a previous life in DG Taxud. I wanted to raise a different tax uh, that was mentioned so far. Um, I heard Agnès Benassi speaking very eloquently about uh, the problems that can arise in the differentials that exist on PIT rates. But uh, in the context of the new commission, the Green Deal, what about the differences in energy taxation? Is there not also a solidarity dimension there um, in the sense that maybe some taxpayers who pay high taxes in some member states might not be happy to help the transition uh, in, in Poland, for instance, where the energy taxation is very low according to the excise data the data on excise duties that are published uh, by, by DG Taxut. And I think the Commission has said that taxation has an important role to play in the context of the, of the Green Deal. How, how do you see progress in, in that connection? So I suggest we collect a few questions. So if there's a second uh, question. Yes, there's a gentleman there in the back. Hi, Matt Thompson, Law360. I'm uh, also a tax journalist. It's just picking up something Maria Theresa said before, which about um, like best practice networks. So, I just kind of wanted to ask, what do you foresee HMRC, the UK Tax Authority's future role, being in that? Given that part of its um, mandate is going to remain within the single market. Sorry, did you understand that? I'm, I'm not sure I got the question. Can you, uh, c could you speak louder? Uh, basically, the future place of HMRC within the best practice networks. So if there are best practice networks of tax authorities within the EU, what is the UK's future role in that? Yeah. Given that Northern Ireland is going to remain within the VAT single market. So, so we assume the UK will leave the, uh, the uh, single market completely. Northern Oh, Northern Ireland. Yeah. Oh, how to deal with Northern Ireland. Okay, okay. Please. Thank you very much for the contributions. Just uh, would like to raise the issue that INAIS put on the place on the uh, welfare aspects related to the revenues. Yeah. 
And also, if we could take into consideration that uh, in the theory, economic theory, how the revenues contribute to the economic development of the countries, take into consideration our European Union 10 years economic crisis. And also in the economic theory said that the indirect taxation excise the uses is kind, if I may say, unfair tax because applies to the white of the citizens. This is we can compare in uh, statistics of the OECD. If you see the Nordic countries, the contribution of the direct taxation to the GDP is higher than compared to the South, where contribution to direct taxation to GDP is more double than personal taxation and corporate taxation. Thank you. So I think there's time for one more question, if there is someone still eager to ask a question. Oh. The gentleman there in the back. And then we can go back to the panelists. Uh, yes, Joe Kerwin with uh, Bloomberg Tax Publications. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. There, as the uh, member states are implementing uh, DAC 6, on the uh, cross-border arrangements that uh, tax practitioners must report. There's been some concern uh, that some member states are including VAT data as part of those uh, reporting requirements, as member states do have leeway in, in uh, implementing the legislation. And I was wondering if, 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 that, if you could um, answer that question, if there's concerns about that and how that's being dealt with. Thank you. Okay, um, perhaps we ask the commission to start. Yes, uh, okay. So, so um, well, I, I will reply to three of the questions uh, that I consider I'm more competent, <laughs> and, and then I will leave also to Pietro, the, the, the most economic one. Uh, so, concerning the energy tax directive that it was mentioned here as um, kind of an example of different rates between uh, member states. So from the Commission side, we, we published an evaluation report last September on the functioning of this directive, where it highlights precisely what, uh, what you mentioned about uh, this uh, disparity of, of rates um, uh, with regard to the energy taxation. And also uh, what it shows is that um, today uh, these rates uh, do not uh, bring uh, the the right price in order to fulfill the goal of climate neutrality by 2050. And that's the reason why uh, the revision of the Energy Tax Directive has been included uh, within the European Green Deal. And as you might have seen in the communication on the European Green Deal published in December, uh, it's scheduled that it will be, there will be a commission legislative proposal in mid-2021. So from now until then, we'll be working together with member state stakeholders and the better regulation process in order to, to, to find huh, the right uh, approach and in order to, to make sure that um, um, the directive itself can be used as an instrument to achieve climate neutrality. But this goes hand in hand with the package that was uh, few, adopted a few weeks ago by the European Commission on the uh, financing of the European Green Deal which were some of the elements that were mentioned. So, can, can yeah. On this point, I mean, just because there's the there's obviously the taxation side um, for the Green Deal, but there's we shouldn't forget the energy subsidies, right? I mean, uh, which is sort of the counterpart, and they are huge in some member states, including in Germany, uh, where we pay huge amounts of money in terms of basically brown energy subsidies. And so I think these two things shouldn't be separated, really. I mean, in the end of the day, um, it's, it's really, it should be the same conversation. I, I hope you, you take the two together, really. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, well, in the Energy Tax Directive, we have, for instance, subsidies to fossil fuels uh, enshrined in the directive. So this uh, had to go. And then all the state aid uh, policies also will be uh, reviewed in this regard. So yes, that we look at. Second question on the Northern Ireland uh, elements. Um, well, uh, Northern Ireland uh, will be under the Northern Ireland protocol that uh, has been uh, agreed uh, with the withdrawal agreement. 
And it's in that protocol where you see uh, all the rules uh, that will be applied. So from the European Commission, very soon there will be notices uh, that will be updated because the last withdrawal agreement, and the final one, I mean, <laughs> it was adopted um, uh, at the end of October. Therefore, it's necessary to update some of these notices. And then, of course, that there, will, there, there is work ongoing in terms of how to make it operational, the Northern Ireland uh, protocol. But with regards to the UK, I mean, UK being a third country, uh, then uh, all the kind of possible cooperation, uh, it's clear that unless there is another type of agreement between the EU and UK, it will have to be done through the OECD uh, framework. So, but that's many ifs, 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 uh, because uh, as you know, the situation uh, uh, now is what it is and there will be new negotiations starting soon. And then concerning the, the last question, I, I would like to, to reply on the DAC6 uh, implementation. Uh, well, I can tell you that uh, n some member states have not even yet uh, kind of uh, implemented all the, all the legislation in place, but uh, concerning the, but very few, fortunately, uh, concerning the issue that you mentioned about some member states also changing VAT uh, data, I, I was not aware of that, so I cannot provide any reply. Maybe if you want to, to send me specifically the question, I can inquire a bit more in order to, to be able to reply because I have no answer on this. And then there was the key question on the welfare aspects of taxation. Um, I don't know whether you yeah. can Well, well you let can me, let, let's perhaps get, get Agnes yeah, first. And the, yeah, Agnes, did you want to react to one or two of the points? Um, Maybe just on the East Russia issues. Yes. Uh, I think uh, two points. First, um, we don't know exactly uh, what you are talking about in terms of amounts, but if you add up uh, the fall on VAT, or fall and avoidance on VAT, corporate income tax, and personal income tax, uh, you get something that is larger than 1% of GDP. So this is a large uh, number. It's large for two reasons. First, it's hot data. If you get if you uh, if you uh, collect this 1%, it's really it's a, a game changer. And also for the perception of the taxpayer. He wants people to accept paying taxes when they use VAT um, to pay these uh, loopholes. Then on the VAT itself, uh, yes, it can be a bit uh, unfair tax. But its uh, objective is not to be fair. So the VAT, the, 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 the job of the VAT, collect revenue, full point. And then, because it's, it's on the full act, a less inefficient taxation, because the tax base is very low. Uh, then, everything depends on what the, the government is doing with the receipts. It can uh, transfer uh, the receipt to, to these uh, limited aid uh, transfers, or it can change. So, for instance, in Denmark, I think the VAT rate uh, is 25%. It's extremely high. Nevertheless, uh, this country has a very good performance review in terms of uh, the efficiency. So I think we, we cannot uh, we cannot draw uh, um, a conclusion in terms of welfare uh, just uh, from looking at one tax. We need to take the whole system, tax and transfer system, in order to have uh, a good vision about the welfare and how it can be improved. Thank you. And Piotr, you have the last Yeah, one. I would like to chip on that. So to um, the VAT, for example, could, can have some welfare elements. It's depending on the uh, kinds of products and the tax rate you have for them. So if you have, uh, depends how much of the basket that is being bought by the different types of households you, you tax on. So uh, many EU member states have different tax rates for different kinds of products. Uh, uh, from ranging from I think five percent uh, to to you know to twenty three, there are not that many EU countries that have a flat ta VAT tax rate on all products. That's you know you don't get that. So there are some welfare elements in the VAT system, but it's as Agnes told you, you need to take into account both the corporate income tax, uh, the personal income tax, and then the VAT. Uh, as the whole elements of the system, because this is what uh, creates the, the revenue mix of, of each country. 
And what I can tell you about the Polish experience is that uh, from 2015 to 2018, because this is uh, the latest Eurostat provided data, uh, Poland increased uh, the tax revenue to GDP by more than two percentage points. So without changing the tax system uh, whatsoever during this time. This is all through reforms that were being uh, created. Also, the companies, we were talking about VAT a lot, but this also increased the uh, social contribution rate compliance, corporate income tax compliance, without any changes to the system whatsoever. And uh, this is something where you can you know, learn a lot. If you do something, you have the will uh, and the force to, to say that this is an issue uh, and to change people's minds, uh, what they do. So up until this point, you know, whoever didn't want to pay taxes, you know, we're a post-Soviet country, basically. So if you didn't want to pay taxes, good on you. You're doing good. You don't want to pay taxes. That's who wants to pay taxes? This was something that was very common. Uh, that it's the unwillingness of paying taxes was, you know, something very, very... Uh, it was it not connected with patriotism or whatever. It was good that you didn't do that. So uh, there's a lot of businesses and people who still think uh, this way, but this is, you know, um, this is also changing uh, because of the, the, what, they, what they also give. The Minister of Finance is not here, so I can say that he represents a government which is more leftist on the social policies areas. And uh, uh, I, 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 I don't know if he would agree with me, so I'm an analyst, I can tell you, so, uh, almost whatever I think and want. But uh, they also in increased a lot uh, spending on um, social, social uh, assistance and uh, pensions. So this is also what they gave back through the increased revenues of the state, so they redistributed it. Uh, to with the welfare policies that increased a lot, and they increased a lot in terms of the size to the GDP. Okay, uh, I think we could go on for a long time. It's a very uh, rich topic, a very um, uh, technical topic also, um, but I think uh, a very important topic and uh, certainly a very important topic to follow and to address, um, especially the, the fraudulent behavior. I think at this stage um, I have to close and thank uh, our three speakers, uh, Agnes, Maria Teresa, Piotr. Thank you so much and please join me in thanking them and also the minister who had to leave already. Thank you.